Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our special presentation looking at books, violence and resistance. This time we're featuring New Beacon Books and Michael LaRose. Um, for those who are interested, the music you're listening to is by the Chevalier, Chevalier de St. George, who was a Black Guadalupe man who was a fantastic composer and fencer um, in the 18th century. So his name is Chevalier, Chevalier de St. George. We'll put the name in the chat later on, but that is his music from the, um, the 18th century. So, if you've not used Zoom before, which is unlikely, but it's never it's possible, um, if you have not used Zoom before, in this presentation, we take questions at the end. And to, to type in a question, all you have to do is find the chat box. So when you move your cursor, there should be a little box that says chat. Um, it's outlined in red on this screen here. And all you do is you type your question into that chat box. You can also send information as well. Um, but for this presentation, we'll take questions after our speakers have finished, and that should take about an hour or so, and then we'll have a, a Q&A session using the um, chat function, um, which you have to type into. Um, there's something called Zoom bombing, and that's when you have weird people will come into the chat box and write um, abusive or rude words. And if that happens, we'll just simply eliminate those people by deleting them from the, um, the chat function. So just to warn you, if that happens, we'll just kick people out. So this event is brought to you by the Sarah Parker Ramon Center, part of UCL, and Black History Walks. People have often not heard about Sarah Parker Ramon, so let's find out a bit about who Sarah Parker Ramon was here. Born in Salem, Massachusetts, a free state, Sarah's family were told they had to segregate. The Ramons believed that they must educate, but the best schools in Salem wouldn't integrate. They were self-made business people and activists, a family of upspoken worldly strategists. Their home was a hub for the abolitionist movement, a place and a space for self-improvement. The books that were shelved, the lectures that were held, the lodges that were dwell meant that Sarah was propelled. Their house was a home for those fleeing slave states, offering a place to stay and a chance to change fates. And Sarah's family would loudly advocate that no skin tone needed to dominate. Her parents made sure she understood the laws of liberty, that segregation and slavery could be pushed into history. Though, though at times black people were outcast, a change would happen if they spoke up and were steadfast. Wade in the water. At sweet 16, Sarah starts to speak up. At abolitionist lectures, audiences were struck by her compelling voice and her grounded words, her empathy and argument made slavery absurd. 1853, the moment Sarah takes a seat, at a theatre she sat not giving in to defeat, she paid for a ticket, a front row treat. When she was asked to move, she refused to concede. The segregated seats for black people was known as nigger heaven. Sarah, 26, had had enough of this oppression. She took the theatre to court, four to one. The theatre had to integrate the seats and pay a $500 sum. Wade in the water, children, wade. In 1858, she sails the Atlantic to Liverpool, crossing the slave route her ancestors sailed before. Back in America, white people saw her as something less, but in Britain she was accepted as she confessed. I have been received here as a sister by white women for the first time in my life. I have received a sympathy I was never offered before. For seven years, she told shocking tales to audiences in Britain, from London to Warrington to Glasgow, all would listen. She didn't hold back on details that were gory. She knew it was essential to telling slave stories. Oh, God's gonna trouble the water. Then she came to Manchester where cotton was king and Sarah knew she had to really let her speech sing. She kept to the task and she didn't change track, quick to point out the profits being made on slave backs. I ask you, raise the moral public opinion until its voice reaches the American shores. Aid us thus until the shackles of the American slave melt like dew before the morning sun. I ask for special help from the women of England. Women are the worst victims of slave power. I am met on every hand by the cry, cotton, cotton. I cannot stop to speak of cotton while women and men are being brutalized. Audiences were taken in by the talk of racial injustice and slavery. Sarah was praised for her passion and for her bravery. Manchester heard the suffering of those across the sea and added their voices asking for people to be free. Sarah had talked of womanhood and family, of being treated like animals or call for humanity. 
In the echoing chamber of the Athenaeum Lecture Hall, Manchester audiences were left enthralled. Oh, God's gonna trouble the water. Sarah always kept speaking up for the oppressed and maligned, the suffragist movement she also got behind. She moved to Florence, became a doctor, on to Rome, fell in love, got married, made Italy her home. She was a generous spirit and an outstanding speaker, a passionate learner and a humanitarian teacher. History can be rewritten, even if the past remains the same. Let Sarah Parker Raymond be a household name. Wade in the water Wade in the water, children, wade in the water, oh God's gonna trouble the water, oh God's gonna trouble the water. All right, so Sarah Parker Moon is not a household name at the moment, but we hope to change it in the next couple of years by doing events like this. So we're actually looking into a number of activities to kind of recognize and promote her legacy, including this event. So this is taking place the 5th of June, and we have a professor called Professor Serpa Selenius who's written a book on Sarah Parker Ramon, and she's going to give us a talk on the history of Sarah Parker Ramon because she was quite an incredible woman. Apart from traveling across the Atlantic uh, at the time, it was quite rare for a woman to do that by herself. She was lecturing against white supremacy, against racism across the country in this country. And then she goes to live in Italy, where she becomes a doctor, which is you know, quite amazing. So we're going to have a full hour lecture on her life and her story on the 5th of June, um, given by Professor Serpa Salinas. So you can look forward to that too. And that's also on our website. And also wherever you booked this event from, you can book this um, coming event on it from as well. So this is a screenshot of the Sarah Parker Mon Center's website. Um, they're based at UCL. They do a lot of really good, interesting work. You can follow them on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, etc. cetera. Um, and apart from doing research, they also put on events and have a very interesting series of podcasts. This is a list of some of, I think it's about 60 by now, um, different podcasts they've done. I'm looking at race, racism, legacy of imperialism, etc. So they cover a lot of really interesting, unusual topics. And you can see there's some big names there. I've got Linton Chrissy Johnson, Dennis Bavell, etc. Um, and there's a, as I said, there's a huge list of them on their website. It's headed by Professor Paul Gilroy, who should be well known to most people um, for his work on race and history. Um, you've got a couple of his books there, which you can probably buy at New Beacon Books, um, and maybe I have a signed copy there as well. But he's done a massive amount of work looking at um, the history of the African Caribbean population in this country, and he's the head of the Sierra Parker Mon Center. So Black History Walks, which is a partner in this organization delivering these talks, um, what we do is we organize walks, talks, and films on the Black History of London each month, all year long, for the last it's almost 15 years now. So every month of the year, there'll be either a guided walking tour somewhere in London, or a film about the African diaspora, or a talk like this one. Normally we do the talks face-to-face -face in a lecture theater, but nowadays, of course, we're doing the lectures online, which is how can we have access to this particular lecture. These are some of the events that are coming up. So if you're interested, just go to our website and um, you can research and find out more about these particular events here. Um, coming up is Jim Kelly, Kung Fu and Black Brit Civil Rights. We're looking at armed, not armed, self-defense in Britain in the 60s, 70s and 80s. Because at that time, if you're a black person walking down the street, you were liable to be physically attacked. And black people said, we have to defend ourselves. So a lot of martial arts groups were set up to actually train people to fight, um, to defend themselves uh, across the country. Um, and Jim Kelly, of course, was an international icon. He inspired a lot of people over here to kind of get involved in martial arts. And we're going to be looking at or hearing from a couple of street fighters who were literally on the street fighting against the National Front against racists on a daily basis. And they're going to talk about how they got into martial arts and they'll recount some of the stories um, that they encounter, that they experienced just living their life, walking on the street and then having to fight on a weekly or daily basis just to walk down the street. So that's going to be quite interesting. That's taking place on Sunday. 
Then we've got a session on gentrification in Peckham. Um, that is another interesting topic, but we have a whole bunch of events. We have about 16 different Black history events, which you can find either on our website, which is at the top there, or you can find it on the event Bright Black History page, which is where you booked this particular event. But I should point out the success of Saturday School's event, actually. So 14th of May, we have um, the superb success of Saturday Schools. And we're looking at a couple of Saturday Schools, and we're going to hear about their successes over the last 25 years. Because in one case, uh, one has been around for about actually 30 years. That's the Alcabellan School of Excellence in East London. And there's another school um, called the West Side Young Leaders Academy in West London. They've been around for about, I think, eight years now. And between the two of them, they've had a massive amount of success with um, when it comes to educating their children. But that success has not become part of the mainstream narrative when it comes to um, the African Caribbean community. So we're going to have a chance to hear about all of the successes of these Saturday schools. Um, in some cases, they go back 30, 30 odd years or so. But as I said, there's lots of stuff to choose from. You can just have a look and pick and choose for yourself. Now, if you missed the previous sessions on books, Balance and Resistance with Mr. Eric Huntley, you can find them online on our YouTube channel. So in this series, we're recording most of the talks that we do, and we recorded the first two, which were with Mr. Eric Huntley, who um, headed up Bogle Literature, Walter Rodney Bookshop, and you can find those lectures online. And this talk will also be recorded, and it should be on this same YouTube um, platform in a couple of days or so. But on that platform, we have about, I think it's 200 videos, mostly do of Black British history, which you can access and look at. We also have lectures that go back 10 years or so on different aspects of Black history. So we have to kind of um, recognize that apart from the bookshops we're looking at in our series of four, there were other bookshops, other Black um, bookshops. So there's a list on the left-hand side there this was passed on to me by Sean Crichton, um, and it was created by another person um, who's given uh, more information about other books in the last couple of days or so. But that's just a little uh, or a sample of the activity that was taking place when it came to providing the community with educational or inspirational or literature to do with the African Caribbean experience. So we're looking at New Beacon books, um, Bogle Overture books, and Centerprise in this particular session, but we actually had contact from a couple of other bookshops who said they'd like to have a session about them. So if you follow our newsletter, we'll announce when we have some other um, bookshops in the same format, which will take place hopefully in the next three to four months. Uh, I should also mention our book. So we have a book coming out titled Black History Walks in London, Volume 1. And basically what the book does is it ties in, or I should say exposes, the African Caribbean history um, in the streets of London. So we have 12 different walks and basically we took two and a half of them and put them into book form and we take people on a guided tour around the certain streets of London and expose or explain or show all the African Caribbean influences, presences, contributions in those particular areas. So that's coming out this year from Jack around the book and um, it does what it says in the tin. So our host for today is Dr. Michelle Asantua. She's written and published those books you see on the, on the top of the bar there. The most recent book is In Search of Mammy Water, which is looking at African water spirits, their stories and their imagery. Um, apart from being a lecturer in literature, she's also a course leader on two of our courses. She teaches the, the amazing, Baldwin, amazing James Baldwin course, and a 12-week course looking at African women resistance leaders. And we go back to a couple of thousand years to more recent times, and we look at Black women around the world who fought back against oppression and resistance against white supremacy, or just did something usual and led people in their particular area. So she's going to take us through a talk with Michael LaRose about New Beacon Books. So I'll now pass over to Dr. Michelle Asantua. Hello, Tony. Thank you very much for the introduction and again the invite to um, host this uh, session in discussion with Michael LaRose. If you could graduate um, Michael to the talk, that would be great because I know he's there. I've seen him. Um, 
Yeah, so then we could we could get going. Um, hope everyone's having a good evening so far. Okay, so welcome. And Michael's just coming in now. We're just giving them time to uh, to adjust to. Yeah, it should be there in like five seconds or so. He's, I can see him. Hello, Michael. You just need to unmute yourself and put your video on, please. Okay, am I on? I can hear you and I can see you, wonderful. Great. <laughs> Hello, welcome. Yeah, you good? I'm good, how are you doing? Uh, yeah, I'm good. Thank you. It's, it's been a it's been a long week, but um, I'm glad we're here, um, and I'm glad that it's it's some some days that we can have some relaxation, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> um, okay, so we're gonna have our little discussion. You were, I think, you saw the two that we did previously with um, yeah. Huntley. So it's it's very much the same format. So thank you for sending me some of your the, these images that you're gonna see. Um, I obviously embellished some and added, you know, along the way. But um, yeah, I just um, wanted to perhaps introduce the bookshop rather than you necessarily. <laughs> um, and that will fall, it, fall into to it as we go. And I'm using the this that you sent me to do that, yeah? Um, this is- uh, Michelle, I can't see you now. Oh, why can't you see me? Tony, can you see me? Yes, I can see you. I've, I've got a, a screenshot with the front of the bookshop and it says part three. You know. Okay. You doesn't have to see you, Michelle. Totally it's cool. Oh, yeah. You, yeah, maybe you don't have to see me then. Okay. <laughs> um, because every, I think Tony can see me, so I don't know why you can't see me. But anyway, hear me okay. I can hear you, definitely. And you can see yourself. No, I can't. All I'm seeing is a screenshot of the front of the bookshop. Oh, that's really quite disconcerting when you can't see yourself. And I'm trying to figure out what your setting is um, that's doing that. Um, we might just have to go, go with it and see, see what happens. All right. Unless Tony knows some miracle that can, what, why, why Michael's not being himself? No, I don't think I, I can fix that. Just carry on and I'll see if I can start as we go along. Okay. Um, so yes, yeah, so about New Beacon Books, which I've got from the publication that you sent me. And this publication is, um, it's a catalogue that was uh, commemorating the, uh, the opening, the 40 year anniversary of New Beacon and also marking um, the passing of um, your father, um, Elder John LaRose. Um, <clears throat> New Beacon Books was founded as a publishing house in August 1966 by um, John LaRose with the active support and assistance of Sarah White. They were joined by Janice Durham in 1979 and Michael LaRose worked with them for obviously longer than the period it says in this book. <laughs> you have never really stopped. Uh, New Beacon Books is also assisted by a dedicated group of volunteers, which is absolutely true and um, continuing, right? Um, growing up in a colonial society in the Caribbean made John LaRose acutely aware that colonial policy was based on a deliberate withholding of information from the population. There was also a discontinuity of information from generation to generation. Publishing, therefore, was a vehicle to give an independent validation to one's own culture, history, politics, a sense of self, and to make a break with discontinuity. It is this conception which permeates the work of New Beacon. So New Beacon was named after the magazine, The Beacon, because most people probably don't know that, you just take it for granted that it's called New Beacon. Um, but it's named after the magazine, The Beacon, which emerged in Trinidad in 1931 to 1932 with contributors such as CLR James, Alfred Mendez, and Albert Gomez. Um, this journal had a tremendous cultural impact that time. New Beacon went into bookselling in 1967 
because of the demand for books stimulated by the formation of the Caribbean Artists Movement, also formed in late 1966 in Britain, and the cultural resurgence among Blacks in Britain that came into being with the Black consciousness and Black activist movement. Okay, so I'll leave it there. I might be able to read some more a bit later. So without further ado, I welcome all of you to um, this presentation on Nican Books. Now, the first image that you saw was, was how it looks, <laughs> but I remember it. And most of you who know this bookshop might remember this version. <laughs> um, and um, so, yeah, this was, this was as you can see there, it's um, 19, uh, established in 1966. You can also see that I, I quite like this image of it because um, it's it's very clear what it is, and uh, you know by now for most of us where it is. Let's introduce it with some uh, with with this um, clip. You've never seen that before, right? I've never seen it. <laughs> uh, it's amazing what people can do these days. What people do and what the, there are people promoting you and in your corner all the time. Great. So, um, okay, so I, I thought we'd, 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 we'd kind of jump right in with some of the publications and some of the reasons behind that. But um, one of the things I wanted to say was um, that um, uh, one of the first books that was published um, by you was was one of um, uh, John LaRose's, um, it was a poetry book. Poetry, yeah. Um, I didn't realize- Foundations. Foundations, and I didn't realize that was kind of stepping in, in footsteps when I also published, first of all, uh, a collection of poetry, which I was like, okay, this is what I'm doing. But the reason why I was doing that was because I was then gonna teach uh, independently creative writing and I wanted my the students that would come to realize okay she's got something published so I published it myself um, just why did um, what was the reason behind um, you know John de Rose's decision to publish poetry um, okay we've got to put it into the framework of why New Beacon was formed in the first place mm -hmm. John the vision for New Beacon comes from the ideas and visions of John Rose, of lessons learned from the past, lessons learned from past struggles, which I'll, I'll go into in a little while. So the institution of New Beacon was to kind of break the hold that uh, metropolitan publishers had over Caribbean writers who had to come up and get their, their stuff published up here. So he was also a poet. And, and as you probably know, everybody knows, I suppose, in, who's in publishing, poetry is very difficult to sell, but he felt there was a value in poetry. And later on, we'll, we'll talk about other poets that he's that he even has published. But he brought with him some ideas and principles of how to organize. And you read that part in the beginning about transferring information from one generation to the other so that people didn't have to remake the wheel, that people knew what struggles had gone in the past, the victories and the defeats, and they could learn and put it into their, their struggles for the present. So he, he came with this, these ideas, and the first was the new beacon institution really. It is a publishing house and then a bookseller. And these were important activities. Why? 
books are a capsule of information, history, art, um, ideas that can be passed from generation to generation so that you learn things from that and you learn things not just for, um, for the education itself but for activism and the struggle against anti-blackness, against um, white superiority and of course for social justice and change for everybody. Mm. So these are the kind of ideas he brought into the institution of New Beacon and also that that not only the transfer of information but the institution should be a, a, a kind of quilombo. A quilombo is the, 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 the fortresses that uh, runaway African slaves made all over the Americas. And in that quilombo, you could have um, the ideas and discussions about radical ideas and literature and art and everything else. It also can be a base for activity and action. So that was the idea for New Beacon, the kind of idea behind New Beacon. So mm -hmm. if you look at the publishing, we can see um, a kind of how those ideas are put into place. You had the republication of historical documents, which were important for people to know about and to pass on to the next generation. You had especially um, publications linked to campaigns uh, in Britain, Africa, the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. You had um, new writers and uh, poetry especially, and that was also another aspect of it. And later on, um, the question of uh, the joint publications of the George Padmore Institute around the International Book Fair Radical Black and Third World Books, as well as um, events around um, uh, different, different people. But the, another real aspect of that early work was this question of CAM, which you, a Caribbean artist movement, which you talked about earlier. Yeah. Okay, we'll we'll come on to some of those actually. Really good to 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 pull some of that out. So ultimately, the, the you know by setting foundations, it was to do with if you if you if you publish as your first publication as a publishers or you know or as an institution, and one of the first thing you put out is poetry. You're making that fine statement that one we're not here to satisfy what mainstream requirements are, nor as a commercial entity but as a long-standing um, aim and objective to, to, be, to be radical, to be different, to be bold, um, and to be an all-embracing entity that will endure. That endure. So, um, the, the, so the, this book here, one of them, the, the, the one on Marcus Garvey. Yes. Um, just what statement was, so what further statement was, um, was um, John LaRose making by publishing that, that book? And, um, who would you say bought that book in particular? Who did it appeal to? Just as an example. Okay, um, I was serving in the book. I mean, I've been working in the bookshop or the, in, the, in the New Beacon institution for at least since I was 10 years old with my brother Keith and later brother Wally. Um, so first of all, at that time, there wasn't much material on Marcus Garvey, which is surprising. And um, this was a, quite an accessible little piece of history, 1887 to 1940, um, for people. And the main people who came in to buy at that time were Rastafarians. They wanted to get something that told them about Marcus Darby. They got it through the music, especially Burning Spear. And so they were wanted to see this thing in writing and learn more about Marcus Garvey. And then generally everybody would then buy the book to find out about Marcus Garvey. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, okay, good. And um, and then these were some of the the, the reprinted ones. Like um, again, like for example, the next one, the Manchester one. I kind of was curious about the titling and the seemingly double titling or the long <laughs> the long titles. Um, why why was that? <laughs> um, do you think? Um, that was an aspect of New Beacon and John LaRose in that he wanted people to understand what was the detail of what was in the books. So you'll find in a lot of our titles, long titles or long subtitles. So he was, uh, there's a statement he makes, we, we did not come alive in Britain. And he was very much influenced by the Pan-Africanism of George Padmore, Marcus Garvey, uh, Kwame Nkrumah, uh, W.D. Du Bois, etc. And so the 1945 Manchester Pan-African Congress was really one which was concentrated on action against colonialism and near victory against colonialism and um, quickly after India and Ghana became independent. But this was a kind of framework, a, a foundation for the ideas of how to deal with the future. Mm. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's an idea that, you know, reprinting some of these works or showing some of these work would appeal or at least would give younger generation that insight, you know, that education. But would you say that young people do come and, and look for it? Do, does that happen or has that be, been happening? I mean, I think we, we can span in four or nearly five generations now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And within that period, we've always been linked to uh, popular political movements or cultural movements. And so in those peaks of activity, people want to know and have access then to that material that they, they didn't know about or have researched and want to find out about to progress their activities and their activism in the future. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, it's not whether they are popular today or tomorrow, um, it's whether they're accessible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because as you said, things go around in, 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 in cycles. So um, yeah, and this is just an image, a couple of image of the early, uh, the bookshop in its earlier days, right? Yeah. Um, is, this a, is this a launch? This is it being more than a bookstore. So what's happening in this picture? Um, as, as I said, this, this Quilombo idea, this, safe okay. space for activity, for debate, for ideas, and for book launches in this case. I think this is, uh, looks like uh, the, the introduction to the poetry of Nicholas Guillen, right. a okay. Cuban poet, an important yeah. Cuban poet, mm -hmm. but because we are divided around English language, Spanish language, French language, etc., cetera, um, it was important to bring this poetry to an audience of English-speaking people. Mm -hmm. I think that it looks like it to me. Well, um, yeah, thanks for that. And thanks actually for, because I realized as I was going through some of the images and doing some of the, the, the research that uh, this would have been my hub when I was studying at London Met. Um, I would have been moved from it whilst I was in Scotland. But when I got back <laughs> to London, this was the place that, because we were linked to that, to, to you were linked to the university. Everyone was marshaled. Um, yes. there and so I got to study uh, Nicolas Guillaume's poetry and this yes. was um, um, Sarah White and um, this so so this is this is the locality now this is being outside of where where is this uh, I'm not sure what event that was you know okay it's um, just a general local event that um, that they yes were. yes I'm not sure which of the event that was Okay, let's move along. I was quite uh, int int interested and intrigued by that whole keeping it within the family or it actually being a family uh, institution, a family business that you all worked um, worked on. Um, so, so tell us about that. Tell us about this. Um, okay. Was, did you um, have a problem with that? Did, were you like, yeah, all right, Dad, I'll I'll not go to <laughs> meet my girlfriend on. <laughs> I'll work in the shop. 
one of, of John's sayings is start where you are. And myself and my brother were right there. So we helped with New Beacon and were committed to the idea of New Beacon. I don't know if it's true to say New Beacon is a family business, but if you're in the family, you've got to be committed to New Beacon. I mean, that, that would be more accurate because New Beacon really, the strength of New Beacon is about committed volunteers who have allowed us to exist since 1966. Without those volunteers, we would not be here. Mm. Um, New Beacon has, um, has, has, has took in people who are committed to the ideas of the institution. And uh, for instance, in one of the photographs there, you see me at a bookstall in North London College. Um, part of the New Beacon ethos is to go where people are. Um, we, um, one of the first, the first memories I have is going to the 1968 Black Power uh, Conference in Alexandra Palace and New Beacon was a box of books. Then New Beacon was, was in a front room, my dad's front room in two houses. And then in the early seventies, we moved to the bookstore front that you know already. Mm -hmm. But uh, at one stage we had four employees and other volunteers. Um, I had to leave uh, the four employees or myself, uh, Janice Durham, Sarah White, and John LaRose. Mm -hmm. um, I had to leave when the cuts came, the Thatcher cuts came, and schools and colleges and libraries no longer ordered books, which is the bread and butter of a bookshop. And uh, as you can see, the two women who took the bookshop on all those years, as I, I was no longer there, and John wouldn't come in so often because he had a, a, a heart problem and had to kind of uh, be careful of how, how often he came to the bookshop. The two women that took the bookshop on uh, for all those years was Sarah White and Janice Durham, who you see in the picture. Um, New Beacon has always been a struggle to keep it alive, to keep it going, to it's hard, uh, the finances of any bookshop is very difficult, but as the, the kind of um, technology moves on and you get uh, Amazon and you have Kindle and you have audio books, um, it's much more difficult to survive as an independent radical bookshop. Mm. In, sorry. I was going to say, which is why, you, which is why you deserve like a real um, credit for for so doing. Because yes, there is there is Amazon and there are those, but you are you are surviving, and um, you know you get support and you do you do know how to, to to do that. You've been in this in the long game, and ultimately, I'm looking at okay, it's, it's 1966, but we're looking at the long <laughs> at the long game. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've had to be creative. We depend on our volunteers. We depend on people uh, like myself and Janice. We took low wages for many years so that we could keep the bookshop going. Um, in 2016, which was our, our kind of 50th anniversary, um, we thought that we had to close the bookshop because financially we couldn't go on. But, um, the new generation, um, we formed something called the New Beacon Development Group, which consisted of my son, Rinaldo, and his wife, um, Vanessa, along with Janice and myself and Gloria Cyrus. Um, we had a, put together a plan to see if we could say, deal with New Beacon and make it as, um, as financially stable as we could. Um, what happened was that we had two real aims. One was to en en engage the new social generation, social media generation. The other generations had known us all this time, but the new social media generation 
did not know us because we weren't visible on new on new technology and 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 social media etc. So um, Vanessa and Ronaldo came up with a plan uh, of how we could do that, and also we had to work out a plan how to how to financially survive, mm -hmm. and that 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 had. Uh, one of the aspects of it was a refurbishment of the whole bookshop in terms of technology, in terms of how we looked and um, changing the space around uh, with a GoFundMe um, campaign, uh, which I think raised about 15,000 and volunteers again to gut the bookshop and uh, refurbish it and um, the bookshop we have right now. Um, and in that picture on the, on the right, you see myself, Janice, and Vanessa um, kind of doing an event at the front of the bookshop. Um, uh, I think it's, it's, it's one of the launches of the new bookshop. Yeah, I mean, I will. I, we will come to all of that. I mean, I like your 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 pace is you're going for it, you know. So that's really great. Um, but I remember the bookshop with um, Sarah White and Janice Durham. I remember going there many a time, and um, they were, you know, always welcoming. Always, you you had that feeling. What it was was as it, you know, the Colombo effect, the effect of going there and just sitting and liming, whatever, or you know, just being in there for for however long. Um, but I I would. I would push you on the fact that it, the commitment was was probably stronger because you had the family element was important too. And we mustn't downplay that because one of the things that I'm aware of in our communities, we tend to see that other communities like especially the Asian communities pass on their um, their legacies intergenerationally. Afri this is an example of Africans doing it, whether we like to call it that or not. This is the reality that's happening here. Because at the end of the day, Vanessa LaRose is your daughter-in-law. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's, I think it's important for, for us to, to recognize that. Yes. Okay, so these are some of the reprints in history. Or did you want to say something? No, no as well, uh, currently, um, our, my grandchildren, our grandchildren and their friends have also committed them to work inside of the bookshop so that it, it's continuing. Okay, which is brilliant. That is that is excellent. Um, yeah, so that long because it will change with, with them. They'll bring in the, the understanding of the new tech as well. Um, so yes, so so these um, titles then are are of the histories and the reprints, which again you were trying to uh, tackle with the new um, new generation. Do you want to talk us through any of these in particular? Right, um, one of them. Uh... Fraudacity was um, a book uh, called uh, in response to a very anti-black um, white supremacist account of the Caribbean by a professor from Oxford or Cambridge called Anthony Proud. And this response to that was was made by a Caribbean intellectual called J.J. J. Thomas in the 1800s. And he not only rebuffed the racism of Anthony Proud, he also wrote a book on Creole language called The Theory and Practice of Creole Grammar. Our languages our art, our literature, our music were constantly and are constantly um, criticized, um, not, not um, appreciated, um, not um, uh, given the, the, the position that it should have in, in society. And what JJ what Thomas was able to do was to not only stand up against the, the, the white superiority, but also validate our own culture, which is a theme that runs through um, uh, New Beacon's work all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's interesting. I actually remember doing as part of my um, 
was it, it was my master's, I think, and uh, Wilson Harris had written a piece where he was also looking at and using some of um, J.J. Thomas's, Thomas's work. So I was remotely familiar with the, with the argument via um, Wilson Harris, who he's not on here. Oh no, there's an X slide with um, Wilson Harris's work yeah. on as well, but you, you did some yeah. with Wilson Harris. Um, okay, and the Trinidad element um, that's yeah. here. Yes, um, the, the folk culture of the Caribbean, uh, and in this case, carnival, has always been important to, to John. During uh, his youth, uh, he was part of the Trinidad and Tobago Youth Council, led by a guy called Lennox Peer, and with people like Carl Alker, Pearl Nunez, who became Pearl Connor, and my mother, Irma LaRose. And they were involved in cultural activity uh, regarding the steel band, uh, carnival, dances, etc. cetera. Um, but they also stood on the shoulders of people who came before them, people who studied our folklore, uh, like J.D. Elder, Edric Connor, and others. So that carnival is becomes a very important institution that we have produced in the Caribbean that mixes up um, our African roots with uh, Indian culture and produces uh, uh, a whole brand new uh, festival for the world. And we know how popular that has been around the world where there are carnival, Caribbean carnivals all over the world. But the first serious attempt to look at carnival as a whole was done by Errol Hill. And um, when the opportunity came to reprint this book, it was a very important book to, um, to be able to reprint. Okay, thanks. I'll actually, maybe I'll read a little bit where, it, where in this publication you, you talk about it. Uh, Trinidad history and politics were central to John's experience. He was clear that the Caribbean wide general strike and workers insurrections during the capitalist crisis of the 1930s were a pivotal point in contemporary Caribbean history. They spawned the Caribbean trade union movement, one of the precursors to independence. So a new beacon um, published key books on this um, topic starting in 1977 with a reprint of the Fabian pamphlet, Labour in the West Indies, the birth of Workers' Movement by Arthur Lewis, with an important afterward, Germs of an Idea by Susan Craig. This was followed by three important works. So Elma Francois, um, which um, it says the NWCSA and the workers, because that would have been <laughs> quite long to put the whole of that out. Maybe you could break down what that is. And the workers struggle for change in the Caribbean in the late 1930s. <laughs> yeah, tell us about Elma Francois, because I didn't really, I didn't know about her um, prior okay. to doing a, a thing on her. Few, few that, that Caribbean white insurrection from Jamaica down to Trinidad was an important event in the history, in our history. And um, Arthur Lewis then wrote this kind of uh, alternative um, account of that, seeing there was um, a Moyne commission sent by the British down to investigate what was going on with all these riots in the Caribbean. Mm. But uh, there was serious activists on the ground and um, a group of them belonged to the Negro, Negro Workers Cultural Association. And that was, uh, within that grouping was Elma Francois and Jim Barrett, who were the leading people in that organization. And their radical politics basically uh, affected people like John growing up. And then there was Buzz Butler, the leader of the Opium Workers Trade Union, and again, whose radical politics shook up the colonial world. And so that's why those two 
um, Labour in the West Indies, Elma Farswa, and then Susan Craig's Smiles and Blood tells us how the British colonialists responded to those insurrections and how um, the people also responded to the British colonialists. Mm, thank you. I mean, is there, I don't know if there are any other books on, on because some of them are, 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 that's the only publication or, or, you know, that's the only biographical. I'm not sure. Is there another on Elma Francois? For Elma Francois? Um, I don't know. I, don't I mean, it's important for us to recognize what you're doing by very putting important. the, uh, being, it's you know, being the to only one to still these, have that. These, uh, uh, activists, mm -hmm. these women activists yeah. who are the backbone of our struggle. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, let's move along. And let's move to the Caribbean artist movement, which because all of this is happening, of course, at the same at, at the same time. There's no like this period is you know, and then it, so um, this is from from when 1960 66 on on till 72. Yes. So tell us about. Um, let me see what I I kind of did have. <laughs> I do have questions just just marginally. Uh, yeah, it was basically how did the Caribbean artist movement develop and what did it aim to achieve? Okay. It had the founders of the Caribbean artist movement were John LaRose from Trinidad, Edward Kamau Brathwaite from Barbados, and Andrew Sulky from Jamaica. And that tells us something. It tells us that um, this question of Caribbean unity and that we are stronger together against petty nationalism is very important. Uh, we should have learned the lessons from the West Indies cricket team. But let us look at these people. They all bring their own resource and their own uh, information. They are artists within their own right. And they want to support other Caribbean artists. And I'm not talking about just writers but also um, visual artists, um, uh, playwrights, uh, poets, um, uh, filmmakers, um, uh, you know, yeah. So they all come together to discuss, to debate. Uh, so once a, once a month, they would meet at the um, West Indian Student Center in Earl's Court and were very influential, not only in Britain and the arts, the artists in Britain, but also as people left and went, went back to their home countries, they also used the debates and discussions that were brought up in CAM in, in their localities. And that's from the Americas to Africa to Asia. Mm -hmm. That is brilliant. I mean, um, one of the ones that uh, Errol Lloyd was in that movement, right? Yeah. Um, and, and Errol Lloyd, I was actually speaking to um, Uncle Eric yesterday and I was saying we kind of need to do something on on Errol Lloyd because he, he just to me, um, he's just he's just been been there just constant. He does a lot of the well, certainly for Bogle Overture did their yeah. public, their, did their covers. Yeah. Yeah, the covers. Yeah, um, and it was him that did this um, beautiful uh, sculpture of your father, and yeah. um, and just he's just like been there, and I think there's something that needs to happen around celebrating um, him. Yeah, I think I I would definitely agree, uh, yeah. and that he's not only a, a visual artist, but he's also a playwright, mm -hmm. and so yeah. he's written plays about um, history, especially Jamaican history which um, I hope to see someday. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and just that history of the voice book as well. This is this is all in harmony or in, in that, um, that context of creating that Caribbean aesthetics. Uh, right. that, yeah, that, that was spoken. And, and a validation about who we are and what we are. I mean, the, his, the, the issue of language, which is dealt with in this, in, in, in Kamau's brilliant book mm -hmm. is is really the essence of dealing and struggling 
with decolonizing our own minds mm -hmm. about who we are and what we are. Mm -hmm. What he's putting forward here is that our language is valid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that our language, which he calls in, in the book nation language, um, is important and stands alone. Uh, a bit like I talked earlier about um, uh, J.J. Thomas's book, uh, Theory and Practice of Creole Grammar. Yeah. So the nation languages of the different islands of the Caribbean are important and stand alone as languages. Um, uh, a good friend of New Beacon, Roxy Harris, has done a lot of work on these issues. And I think uh, we published a, a book on, uh, I forgot the title right now, but a book on, on the question of language here in Britain and uh, why to understand that language is very important. Mm. Yeah, thank you for that. Because, um, you know, books like um, this one by um, uh, Edward Kamal, um, helped me certainly as well when I was also writing my book and the, the fact of the aesthetic in something buried in the yard which I was actually presenting on yesterday and the, the reader who'd read it because it was like this book club she's Russian um, by you know she's she's Russian and she's having to navigate her way through um, Creole the Guyanese version of it and she, she obviously found it difficult but we're like yeah but this is it I mean how else do you break down these um, barriers how else do you ever get to know the difference and celebrate it as well and I took a lot from these work Edward Kamal Brathwaite was one of my my mentors uh, in terms of book form as well yeah. as he, he, he wanted to break down this question of bad language and broken English and patois as, as term, did the wrong term yeah. about our nation language. Yeah. And it's very important if you understand that uh, from, from a, a, a language learning point of view, it helps with learning standard English as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we could talk about that. The reason why it's, it's bugging me is because I know we still haven't won that war with, with some of those Definitely. countries. Definitely. Definitely. As a language. Um, okay, so then these were dealing with some of the, 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 the what, what was important about the novel then uh, for, for John LaRose and New Beacon? Right, I mean, he really thought that the novel was a unique literary space where a lot of issues could be tackled and um, addressed in, a, in, a, in an artistic way. So, um, do you have the, the, the uh, a slide with um, Erna Brodva? Of course I have a slide with Erna Brodva. What do you mean? No, uh, let, me... <laughs> let, let me just deal with the ones I have in front of me then. Okay, I'll go back. That's okay. just to tell you that I do. <laughs> okay, this, this is the question of one, um, poetry being important. Yes, and then we have poems of succession, uh, the Guyanese poet Martin Carter, which you could say is the poetry of decolonization struggle. He is the poet of our decolonization struggle. We have um, uh, uh, Dennis Scott, uh, you had uh, Mervyn Morris, you had um, Lorna Goodison, um, new voices of poetry, putting forward some of them pretty standard poetry approaches. You had um, the one you see up there, Anai Kelanjan, who's from Sudan, and he, uh, The Myth of Freedom, and his book is important for the struggle in Sudan for, at, at that time um, against the North, uh, uh, and for uh, a kind of autonomous region. So we have these, po uh, uh, again, Eternity to Season, a kind of poetic prose, poetic prose um, approach, which is pretty new, pretty uh, radical from Wilson Harris, who is um, his critical work, which we've also published, and also with Van Sertema, which is also it important again about validation of we talking to our artists and talking about our own art 
and having that validation ourselves and, and happy to, to put that out to the world. Mm. Um, the two at the bottom, uh, Bad Friday and uh, Heroes of the Day, were young uh, British, black British writers. Uh, I think Noah Smith was the first, the first black British novel. Bad Friday was the first black British novel. I think we, we, we printed it. Um, Rural, Rural White, Heroes of the Day, was again one of these early black British novels with a different style of writing, new type of writing, which um, again, if we, but if we go on to um, Erna Brodberg, yeah, uh, Erna Brodberg's work, uh, the first novel, Jane and Louisa will soon come home, which is the top, one the top row there, was, um, really um, took John's eye as a new way of writing, new style of writing. And to some people, it may have been uh, kind of risky, but um, he believed in her and she we subsequently, subsequently um, um, published uh, four and five more books by her. And she's now recognized as one of the leading writers of the Caribbean. Thank you. I mean, I literally could speak about Erna Brodba <laughs> this whole session. That slide there was not one I had to recreate from images you sent me. This slide here is one that I was using on Wednesday in my, okay. Afrofuturist, in my Afrofuturism course. Um, I was introducing all those students as I continue to do to earn a Brodba's work. And um, this one in particular was the book that they I, I tried to encourage them to read. I know they struggle. Louisiana. Louisiana, Louisiana sorry. I, I know they struggle with it um, and I told them to persevere with it. And those that completed it absolutely loved it. As I, I was the same because I had to also do this for um, as an undergraduate and equally was like, what is this? And um, it was Dr. Patricia Murray, who was my uh, teacher. She said to tutor, she said to me, just, just go with it. And I went with it, absolutely loved it and thought, and then later on, I had to teach it at university. And again, had to go through this cycle of students rejecting this. And, um, and so, yeah, it's, it's phenomenal. And it was the reason why it's on the Afrofuturist class is because Erna Brodberg does some very fantastic and amazing things in this work um, where she she effectively is doing speculative what we call speculative fiction because uh, she uses the technology as the instrument of mediumship with by the ancestors and um, and these kind these this John LaRose for me seeing that being you know I know lots of people have difficulties with it but it's it's very very um it's up there with um what's the what's the one uh beloved for yeah. me it's it's a it's beloved because again the independence of the publishers and not that mainstreamness is why this book is not really given that acclaim but I just wanted all of the listeners <laughs> to go out there and purchase any one of these books, but I do recommend uh, Louisiana by Erna, Dr. Erna Brodberg. And, and there, there you have the, the kind of real um, function of the New Beacon Institution to bring that kind of work out there. At least you can access it. Maybe it is difficult to read, but at least you can access it. And now people are getting it. Yeah, I mean, and that, and to, to to say that the books are well uh, studied, like you said, but they tend to be by probably by white academics in remote spaces that really do. I doubt whether even in her own Jamaica that people, you know, know about. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that, you well, know, yeah. Except, no. but that, that won't let us stop. That won't let us stop us. Yes. No, 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 not at all. Not at all. I actually modelled my uh, something buried in the yard on Erna Brodberg, starting with Mile first of all. So, 
Um, so let's go on to a bit of the struggling, the other types of struggle that was going on um, and the mangrove grove nine. I don't know whether this clip relates is from this one or whether this is at, at the Oris of a one, I don't know, but um, were there two different ones? What was it? No, no, there's only there's only one, but but play it. That, that I'll play it. Let's see if, if yeah. this is the one. Judges about judges and nothing's been done. Now it's time to do something ourselves. That statement was made at the mangrove demonstration and represents the essence of black people's experience in Britain. That since we've come here, we've suffered a long train of abuses by the police with the active knowledge and support of the British state. And those abuses have been able to be carried out under the pretext that, quote, black people are criminals, sponsors, and prostitutes. That is a myth that has been created about us. That is a statement that was made by one police officer who gave evidence in the mangrove case. Now, the demonstration that black people made against the harassment of the mangrove restaurant, the subsequent resistance in the courts, is an active explosion of that myth. Okay, that was just a portion of a longer, a longer piece. This is, is the Mangrove Nine film. Uh, okay, all right. Okay. Franco Rossi and John LaRose. Okay, so Horace so had, had a role in it as well. Say that again. Horace Ove did have a role in it as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Um, could you tell us a bit about your involvement, um, New Beacon's involvement with the Mangrove Nine? Okay, again, it comes from John's involvement. Mm -hmm. Um, this was uh, the, the, the demonstration about the Mango restaurant being raided by the police on many occasions, and the, one of the Black Power organizations, the Black Panther movement, led by the person you see there, Althea Laquant Jones, uh, organizing a demonstration and that demonstration ended in uh, some fighting and, uh, and arrests. And the Mangrove Nine campaign, the nine people arrested uh, around the, this demonstration, the Mangrove Nine, took place. Now, this was a seminal, important moment in the history of Britain. First of all, the way the campaign was organized was a blueprint for other campaigns about police malpractice and brutality and deaths in custody after that. It was also the case where we worked out how to deal with the police and the court system so that we win. One of the aspects of that was you had to have lawyers who would stand up and say that the police were dishonest, they lied, and they were corrupt, and they were also racist. We had in the Mango of Nine campaign, we had that with a Scottish, a young Scottish lawyer called Ian MacDonald. And in subsequent cases, following the Mangrove Nine, Ian MacDonald played a key role in those, camp in those future campaigns. One of the main things that came out of it was how to organize yourself, your campaign against the police and the courts. And at the end of the, and at the, end of the Mangrove Nine case, um, we were, it was, it was decided that it was a victory with people not being prosecuted, but also that the judge in his summing up admitted that there was 
racism in the police force. It's kind of hard to understand that this was not accepted, but you know, Britain is always in denial. So that if they, they, there's the first time that um, a judge had said that um, the British police were racist. Mm. Okay, thank you. I was wondering, this is the, the, um, the BBC uh, version here. Let's just look, look at a trailer, the Small Act series by Steve. Um, yeah, Steve which is, which is uh, uh, based on fact, as they say. And so they came to, the, did they do the research um, by, um, at George Padmore Institute, which will come on? Yeah, to. the George Padmore Institute is really an archive of the black struggle in Britain. We formed it in 1991, and um, it's still going strong. And it's in the same building as the, as the bookshop. The book, the, the, the archive is above the bookshop, two 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 floors above the bookshop. Mm -hmm. And um, so, when they were making the, the film, the, the Steve McQueen film, they came to uh, the, the GPI uh, archive to find materials um, for, for, the, for the film. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's have a look at uh, the trailer of it. On Sunday the 9th of August in North Kensington, a demonstration took place against the police, which degenerated into totally inexcusable violence. There may be some who believe that they have been the victim of injustice at the hands of the police. Others who, like parasites, feed on these beliefs and seek to turn them to their own advantage, deliberately creating hate and violence. These defendants are all guilty of the serious criminal offence. This attack on a black establishment is not an isolated event. actually quite a good um good production so it's doing what it says uh, new beacon and the, the collaborative with george padmore which is that institution that accessible um archive and history for newer generation um okay um one of the things obviously um i i wanted to know was um so we saw in the last couple um that the that iconic image with um baba eric huntley who was standing outside um having to clean up all kinds of um, matter uh, outside their bookshop. Did New Beacon Hat experience for themselves any racist um, yeah. in the shop? I, what, what, what happened um, in this period, uh, I think it was 1977, was uh, Unity in Brixton, uh, Bogle Louverture, or what later became Walter Roddy Bookshop in Elin, Head Start in Tottenham, and New Beacon itself in Finsbury Park all had some form of racial attack, uh, firebomb in the in the, the the slide on the the left. You can see uh, I think at the top is Unity, then the right hand at the top is Bogu, then the left hand corner is um, Head Start, and the one right at the bottom. Uh, I can't read it properly, niggers out, that's New Beacon. Right. So when these things were happening, um, we, uh, you know, there's this, this questions of, of politics of alliances. And your quotation at the top, New Beacon has always felt the important to encourage others with similar interests and perspectives to join hands wherever possible to bring about progressive change. That applied to a lot of our what we did and then and, and in the future. Um, so what was formed was bookshop joint action so that people should be informed about what was happening to black bookshops, uh, independent black bookshops. And um, it was important that uh, we put out statements demanded things of the police and the government regarding uh, the 
the fascists and racists who were operating with impunity at the time. Mm. Okay, okay, thank you for that. Let's let, let me try and move to the next one. Okay, and then this is uh, now continuing. Um, talk us through these ones, um, please. Okay, um, this may be a bit long. What is this? <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is what was important um, for black parents in Britain was education. And for a long time, um, the first generation, what John used to call the heroic generation, did not quite understand the nature of British society, its anti-blackness, its racism and white superiority. And so it would clash with the, their children over what was not happening in their schools. And um, their children, John would call the rebel generation, that's my generation. Uh, and there were a lot of us and we didn't take shit. So one of the things that was kind of revealed and discovered about Britain was the way working class people were treated and how they were educated. And black children moved into that area of, of of, of the working class area of people in the education system. And so um, there were, when we recognize those, those, those mechanisms against black children, um, there was the busing, there was banding, uh, busing black children out to other schools so that there's no concentration of black children in one school. And in this part of North London, led by John and West Indian, um, uh Standing Conference, um, they, 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 they organized and activated themselves about the way their children were being treated. In another organization that John was involved with called SECWA, um, Caribbean Education and Cultural Workers Association. They had done some research and got information from black parents and, and, and young people about what was going on in schools and asked Bernard Cord to write a book, How the West Indian Child is Made Educationally Subnormal in the British School System. Educationally Subnormal is, is EFN. And um, we published, you can publish that book. And which is another aspect of how we operate is that we are attached to movements. And this was uh, a campaign book. So this was taken around to meetings of black parents to make them understand what was going on in the British education system and how their children were being treated um, mm -hmm. because they were being lied to. And, mm -hmm. um, put into ESN schools, and also uh, it affected their futures. Is this book, because this book, we, we quite we hear it often, is it, I mean, in print or do you just have copies? Is it, re, has it been re, up, reprinted, updated? This, this, this was the first print, that was, that was the New Beacon one. Right. It's subsequently been print, reprinted. And right now there is a, a new, reprint and with extra material produced by Bernard Cord and we ha and it's now available. Right, yeah, that was recently done. Yes, I remember. Yeah. Okay, and um and this is some more um on yeah. I actually put these here because um obviously these publications continue that that um that context of the struggle in terms of education, which um, Professor Gus John, you know, um, book and does work around um, continuously. Yeah. Um, but this quotation here, um, which says in many areas of investigation is coming from this commission of race report, race and ethnicities disparity, that report that is so controversial for, for these reasons. This is just one of a long 258 page document. Um, 
Um, in many areas of investigation, including educational failure and crime, we were led upstream to family breakdown as one of the main reasons for poor outcomes. Family is also the foundation stone of success for many ethnic minorities. Another revelation from our dive into the data was just how stuck some groups from the white majority are. As a result, we came to the view that recommendations should, wherever possible, be designed to remove obstacles for everyone rather than specific groups. I mean, how what was your response um, to this report? Um, Go, given the struggles. <laughs> <laughs> the struggles, I mean, I'll, I'll come back to your slides in a moment, mm -hmm. um, but I, I was explaining that the, the exposure of that heroic generation about the problems of the rebel generation caused a reunification of black parents and black youth. And that's the manifestation of that is the black parents movement and the black youth movement. I'll go, go into that in a moment. Um, going back to the original reason for New Beacon existing, if we leave it to British historians, uh, black lives move, the black lives um, matters movement will be talked about just as a USA phenomenon. They will not talk about, uh, they'll talk about a rabble uh, knocking down the statue of a slave trader and throwing it in Bristol Harbor. They'll talk about how Boris Johnson uh, saved Britain from the COVID-19 in a Churchillian way. If we don't write our own histories, if we don't write our own books, if we don't um, make our blogs and essays and all the new technology that we can use now, audio books and people like yourselves, um, we will be left with the, black, the historian saying that uh, a black uh, commission in 2021 said there was no institutional racism in Britain. That's really all I have to say about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thank you for that. Um, and then these ones are now, um, oh, again, these are now the wider campaigns, right? You know, the campaigns um, that, that are along the lines, which you mentioned these in the, in the earlier part, um, just to show the publications that come out of them. Um, you know, generally, the, uh, the you know, what I love about them is that Pan-African, um, Pan-Caribbean um, um, element to all of these. Um, yes. and he said we wouldn't, we wouldn't know um, about... Some, some, some of these campaigns, some, these are linked to campaigns, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And some of these campaigns, New Beacon is the base, is the place where people can operate from to, to make these campaigns. The, the mm -hmm. struggle for carnival here in Britain, the questions of um, repression of, of writers and other activists in, 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 um, in Kenya, mm -hmm. the, uh, the, um, the activism for mm -hmm. control and for a new type of Nigeria, the lessons of the Grenada Revolution the revo that was uh, snuffed out mm -hmm. and had internal problems before it was snuffed out. Mm -hmm. um, we have Zaya Yebo talking about uh, Jerry Rawlings coming to power mm -hmm. as a possible positive thing, but their experience turned out to be the, the history of um, uh, people masquerading as things they're not. Mm -hmm. And finally, um, the New Cross Massacre, where the New Cross Massacre Action Committee and the Black People's Day of Action in 1981, again, was a pivotal moment in the history of Britain. And uh, John LaRose was, was chair of, of that committee. Uh, and we've got two pictures here, um, one of uh, a Black parents movement and Black youth movement um, uh, March demonstration around Cliff McDaniels in 1975, who was 
the school friend of my brother, Keith, who was beaten up by police outside the police station and charged, and he, the police back down, he was charged with assault. And um, based upon the Mangrove Nine um, uh, organization and strategy, uh, we won the case and overturned that case. But there was a, a there were many more cases that came out of that. Newton Rose is um, one I remember, and of course the New Cross Massacre Action Committee. And I think you can see me there, uh, next to to the left of the guy writing down whatever's being said. Uh, that's me there in the demonstration, and then my mum at the front there. Uh, and then the third, the, the picture to the right is um, the, the New Cross Massacre uh, meeting, um, I think in both, in 1981, I think that is. Um, and as you can see, part of what we wanted to do with that campaign was to make sure people understood who died in that fire. And that's why those pictures at the front of each person each young person and their date of birth and date of death. And next to John, next to John standing up speaking are the parents mm -hmm. of those who died. Mm, yeah, thanks for that. It's a very powerful um, photograph actually that you don't um, see. And it tells, it tells so much in it if you, if you yeah. know some of the story. Okay, and so, we had some of this last time about the radical um, international radical book fair. What I was actually interested in, um, I obviously can't see you in this picture. I can see yeah. Janice Durham and I can see John LaRose and I can yeah. see Sarah, yeah. Sarah White um, um, from New Beacon. Um, but what I was interested in was what were you doing? Because I, I know <laughs> Akaba was performing, yeah, yeah. Akaba was performing. What were you and Keith, what were you doing at, at, in this? All right. Were you there? Um, a lot of the people that came out of the supplementary school also then graduated to be part of the Black Youth Movement and uh, part of the football teams we formed and also went down to form a carnival band and the sound system and all that. And those people, uh, in 82, when we started the book fair, um, it needed a lot of organization, a lot of people to um, get the book fair on the road. And there was not only just the book fair, which is the picture you see in the top left-hand corner. Yeah. There was also a festival of politics mm -hmm. and culture that went with it every night. Mm -hmm. So it was a huge event. Mm -hmm. If you, it, next to Chalk Dust, Mm -hmm. Standing up. If you look mm -hmm. to the left of him, you can see me. Ah. Oh. I'm chairing one of the forums, that, that, that particular forum. Okay, okay. Yeah. I was wondering. Uh, so, my, m one of my roles was a kind of logistical role of uh, one, the, the, the book fair as it was set out and there's also marking out the space and making sure everybody took care of their spaces and uh, being part of the forums and also taking books and, and um, uh, people who were participants up to the book fairs in Bradford and Manchester. Mm. And also um, being the kind of archivist uh, through audio recording most of those events in the book fair uh, and then <laughs> part of part of all of that was um, you know the international poetry evening which was really a magical moment within that within that book fair uh, uh, experience it's uh, a cassette <laughs> it's a cassette now but that's it, that that is a, it's a cassette and a and uh, LP, anybody who's got any, um, any, uh, <laughs> I've got, I've got the cassette of this actually. <laughs> I've still, I still yeah, I've been told that cassettes and, and vinyls come back. So, okay. Be... I've and got, then, I've got one. And then foundations of a movement, as you see there, 
is really the 10th book fair. And if you want to really understand the scope and power of the International Book Fair Radical and Third World Books, then you will read that. And it's not only a tribute to John Rose, but makes, makes, the, makes you understand the network of radical ideas that all the people that took part in the book fair, writers, activists, etc., and people just interested in books, um, what an impact that made on people. Uh, so it's very important um, to, to understand that. And that, that global network of activists um, still still exists uh, from those book, from that book fair experience. Mm. Okay, thanks for that. I just wanted to whiz through some of these now so that we can yeah. we can get to the end and get some some uh, some feedback uh, or, or questions from the audience. So yeah, I mean this was one of um, the publication on John Leroy's dream to change the the, um, the world. So this was he was in the middle of doing this. Uh, what, what happened, um, John died in 2006, and um, this film was made by Horace Ove, I think, in the year before, or maybe a bit longer. So I would see Horace in Trinidad, and he would say, oh, I'm just going down the road to film somebody in Arima, which is the, the, the town where my, my dad was, was, was brought up. Um, and so he would be making this film as he, as he, as he went along, and um, it was it was finished. Uh, I think just before my dad died. Okay, wow. Because I was wondering, yeah. So that was that was uh, effectively John LaRose's last um, publication. Yeah, and, and that DVD is available. Yeah, and this is just to show uh, some of the co, the dual work of George Padmore Institute and um, New Beacon Books. These are some of the um, publications. And this is an installation that you did. Um, yeah. This at the, where was this? Where was this? This is, is it a museum? Right, okay. In the Angel. And this was 2015. Mm -hmm. And it was an exhibition called Dream to Change the World, uh, the legacy of John LaRose. Mm -hmm. And um, it, 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 it was pretty powerful, pretty, very well done uh, mm -hmm. by the GPI at that time. Mm -hmm. And it was um, then turned into a book by the GPI. And that book again is also available. Mm. Okay, brilliant. So by now, this just to so that uh, listeners can see that this was part of that campaign um, that you mentioned at the beginning, um, when in 2016 you needed to raise this uh, funds. I remember that that time very well. This is your son Ronaldo here, and of course, this is this was the one of the the videos that went around showing calling us to action. Um, yeah the community to action and of course this is hi guys my name is vanessa la rose and you're inside new beacon books we just want to say a massive thank you to the community for all your help and support we've come a long way since our save the bookshop campaign in january and what we've managed to achieve with your help is amazing we had people come in and donate their free time donate free materials all in the aid of keeping this bookshop open. Now we have a fabulous space, still with some little bits to do, but now we have a fabulous space so that we are ready to be here for another 50 years. We have a community space, we have a website, and none of that could be achieved without the help of the black community. There is a saying that we cannot come together, we don't support one another, this project right here has smashed that to pieces. We have come together in droves to make this what it is now. We could be more grateful. So on behalf of the LaRose family, New Beacon Books, we thank you if you volunteered, if you donated via our GoFund, if you bought a book through our book club, if you shared and just promoted New Beacon Books, we thank you. It's beautiful, right? 
So we're here. Hi guys. Um, and so these are some of the books that you you know you have a stack of the books your your yeah. publications. Uh, yeah. So yeah, and I just wanted to show that you're online as well. This was all um, thanks in part to that um, funding. You've got a new look website, so people that want to access the material can go there. Um, yeah, you can access the material and buy it directly, and we'll we'll send it out. Again, it's a part of that book, the book service we started many years ago, uh, and also you can book uh, an exhibition to come to you of books that you're interested in, or we can show you. Okay, thanks for that. I wasn't aware of that. Um, and this is just to, to say, yeah, this was when uh, it was. This is a new look. Uh, was this a new look or was this before? Because that's uh, it looks like it's before. Yeah, it was before, and um, and then this was Nadia Joseph here doing yeah. a presentation on the launch of her. Was it her father's? Um... No, this this one was the Mandela letters. All oh, right, okay. Uh, yeah. which, which they're very um, involved in in regards to uh, closeness to the Mandela family. Right. Um, just to make a point about Jeremy Corbyn, uh, he, we've always been involved with, with him and his activities, and he's always supported the bookshop. Um, and people need to understand and know that after the, the sphere he's been having uh, in the last couple of years as leader of the Labour Party. Mm. Okay, yeah, thank you. It's important that we um, record that and have that down. This is when you were African African rights. I, I actually... Yeah worked here okay. uh, yeah, yeah that was that uh, that was quite fun um that day and you know just showing that yeah the book was very well received and very well looked forward to by uh, a younger generation of readers um, yeah that, that's that's the important part yeah and here it's i i didn't realize i'd forgotten that i had all of these by the way i just <laughs> have to very good i need to get some copies yeah, definitely, actually. Um, so, yeah, so this is when one day, I don't know how many of these you had, but I think a few of them, they were the market when it turned into like a little mini market. The black market, we called it black market. market. Yeah, so that was absolutely wonderful. Mm -hmm. This was downstairs, you had the books and the cards, and then you yeah. went upstairs and you could just feast on on clothes and, and jewellery and, and so on. So that was yeah. really this, this was uh, a new idea that came out of um, Vanessa and Ronaldo. Yeah, I know, I'm aware. And then, just to remind you, that we, myself, Tony and I, also taught courses at New Beacon. We taught yep. uh, James Baldwin course there, and we did the African Women and Resistance, and later on we also did the Tony Morrison course. Uh, which I don't have an image of, but we did that as well, and that was we loved. Doing it. This is our this is our preferred place to 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 do it. Um, so so that, that goes back to the Quilombo idea yeah. of a safe space for us to do activities that maybe we won't get anywhere else. That's okay. the whole point of the, the new beacon and GPI. I just wanted to say thank you and read this last bit about John LaRose's vision and contribution are unique. In his lifetime, he was able to participate in putting these ideas onto film in Oris Ove's Dream to Change the World, as you've just mentioned, a film about John LaRose. Um, John LaRose's vision has informed an amazing body of publications produced by New Beacon Books over now 50 years, because this was taken yeah. in this publication. Actually, your words. Yeah, these yeah. are your words in yeah. honor of your father and in honor of New Beacon. And um, Michael LaRose, it is, has been my honor and privilege to be speaking with you about the life and legacy of New Beacon Books and long, long, long may its success continue. Thank you. Thank you very much and thank you for the invitation. Just to say that um, the struggle continues. Uh, New Beacon will, you know, is always juggling, always trying to be creative, always trying to survive. And let's see if we can get through this next phase, which has been very difficult for us. Thank you very much. I will stop. Right. Well, we're not done yet. I'm going to ask you some questions, Michael. So hang on a second. No we just have to say a few things about what's coming up so people know what to look so for in the future. Yeah.
All right, so now we're in the Q&A section and we'll take questions via the chat in a moment. Just have to mention that this event is brought to you by the Sarah Parker Mon Center in association with Black History Walks. Um, if you missed the first two sessions in this series, looking at books, violence and resistance, you can find them on the youtube.com slash Black History Walks channel. So we have a, a channel on YouTube and there's about 200 videos there, but the most recent um, talks we did on books and resistance are on this channel and you can access them right now or tomorrow, but they're there for you to kind of um, watch and digest in the future. So Black History Walks organizes walks, talks and films each from the year of Black History. Um, the walks are suspended now because of the whole virus thing, but, but hopefully be back by the end of June. The talks have moved to be online. We're going to have a river cruise at the end of June 27th of, of June, to be precise, and we'll mention that or I'll show you that a picture of that later on. Sarah Parker and Mon Center is working with us to actually have these events. So the fact that this event is free and online and recorded is part of the kind of collaboration between um, Black History Walks and Sarah Parker and Mon Center. So please check out their website and their work. They're doing a lot of good um, research into the study of racism and racialization. Um, and that's an area that needs a lot of <laughs> work and exposure if you think about the current situation at the time. Next thing, well actually this is not until May, um, which is two weeks away from now, but we're looking at Saturday School. So one thing that wasn't really mentioned um, so far is that um, New Beacon Books had a Saturday School above it. And that's another long story because I suppose we could do three or four sessions on New Beacon Books because it's just, just like um, Mr. Huntley. They did so much work over such a long period of time that you can't do it justice in just one session, I suppose. Um, but we can come back to these issues in the future. But we're gonna have a special section looking at the successes of Saturday schools, who organized them, how they funded them. And we're gonna hear from some of the pupils who went to schools back in the 70s or 80s and are now big people. And we'll also be hearing from some of the kids or young people who are at school right now as to how the Saturday school has empowered them and give them more energy and, and more confidence to actually take on the racist school system here. So that's taking place 14th of May. That's another free event. You can book your tickets now. The Black Liberation Front um, should be better known than it is. And again, that's what we do in these events because apart from being a, a, a Black power group, they also had a bookshop and young people between 16 and 25, uh, part of the Young Historians Project, actually tracked down the members of the BLF, interviewed them, recorded them, and made a documentary about them back in 2017. So long before um, you saw the stuff in the BBC recently, long before that, these young people tracked down the BLF, interviewed them, filmed them, made a documentary, and we're gonna have the young people who made the film, as well as the um, surviving BLF members on a session like this, where we're going to hear from um, uh, them about their experiences. And this is a clip of the document that they made. So look at this here. BLF was a Pan African nationalist black organization. You weren't letting people call you colored anymore. You weren't letting people call you Negro anymore. You know, you were like, we're the Africans, this is who we are. We don't like it, tough luck for them, you know. You were called black, this black, that, all the, all the ignoble things about being black were called. So we knew we were black. But there's nothing we could have, we could have done to elevate ourselves apart from joining the black movement. Just having those two words put together like that, black power, it was like I wanted to be part of them. We were really, as a group, just kind of waking up to a political consciousness. Well, of course, that was going to be considered dangerous. The state came down very viciously. Antonio was actually arrested, tried, and jailed for this article. And we begin to understand that we are not playing with revolution. We're not playing with radical politics because the state was taking us seriously. We, we were really in, in danger of uh, losing our freedom. So 
the way we've done this is that you can actually watch this documentary online right now or next week, whatever. And then when you're ready, you can get your ticket for um, the Q and A with the um, the people who were in the Black Liberation Front and the people who made the documentary about the Black Liberation Front. All you got to do is um, go to our website or go to Eventbrite and then click on the link and book your tickets. Another big event that we have coming up is this one. And basically there's a the unit in UCL that has tracked down where the money went from the slavery compensation 1830s. So when slavery was abolished in 1834 or 1838, um, the British government gave 20 million pounds to the slave owners. And what this unit has done, they've tracked down who got that money where they lived and what they spent the money on. And they've also begun to track down some of the stories of the enslaved people on the plantations. So on the 29th of May, we're gonna have a demonstration from the um, LBS as to, as to how to use the website they created to track down who, what, where um, got money from slavery conversations. So that's a, a very popular event. Last time we did it, we had about 200 people in the, in fact, we couldn't fit them into the room, they were flowing out the door. But this will be an online event, so again, you can, Click on the link and get your tickets now. This is a really interesting uh, event and it's take place the 29th of May. Linking into the African diaspora in the Caribbean is, is identity. And sometimes when it comes to black films, they don't get the chance to be shown in a mainstream cinema. So for this one, we're actually going to show this online. And let's have a look at the trailer to see what it's all about. Here's the six years of torture, and finally, freedom. Joseph, Joseph, you've done all you could. Deal with it. Joseph, promise me you will go. A lot of the things I've read about Africa freaks me out. <laughs> and, uh, I keep telling you, you're reading the wrong books. <laughs> There's some things that are just non-negotiable, and that's the use of bush medicine in my hospital. Never gonna happen. That's what Grandad made his living from in a compound, and we know he was a master at this. You bring any bush in the hospital? Dirt, enough, enough. No, we are a family of professional doctors. Let's all learn. Everyone walks through these doors. They're expecting a miracle. Preserving the family legacy is also your responsibility. You are descendant of Nani. Many mighty warriors. Grandad was saying that it was. Grandad, Grandad, every time you open your mouth, his name come out of it. You know what? I had to endure under that man's hands. So, because of that, you're going to stop me from living the life that I want to live? Hell no! I'm done with pleasing you and everybody else. I hate you! What are you looking at? You should stay away from me. I'm poison, Joseph. Is that gang just smoking Rasta girl, right? Look, Mom, even if it is, it's still my decision. How do you know my name? Where do you see my son? You're like a candle that cannot be hidden under a bushel. Where are you going? To look for my son. I beat him, I beat him. No, 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 piss out. I'm on a journey to reconnect with my ancestry. Many more will find their way home. May the souls of my two heroes rest in peace. Ah! I'll be there in Ghana with you. Yeah? <laughs> That's not how we talk. That's telling. how you talk. <laughs> All right, so someone mentioned we should make our own documentaries, and that's been done, or we're doing at the moment. Um, and we're also making our, our own narrative drama stories. Well. This is just one example. We do this sort of thing all the time. We show films from the African diaspora on a regular basis, both physically and online. Again, just to shout out some of the book shots that have, we have not covered, because it wasn't just New Beacon and um, uh, Bogle of Aturan Centrifies. There were other bookshops as well. This is to, just to recognize some of the bookshops that we know existed across the country in Birmingham, Wolverhampton, um, and Bristol. So just to kind of shout them out and recognize them. Our book comes out this year from Jacaranda Publishing, which is a, a black female publishing house. And basically the book is about the black history that you can find in various streets in London. And that should be a very interesting read. So at this point, let us hand back to Dr. Michelle Asantua and let's take some questions. I've got a question for you, um, Michael, if you're still there. First of all, can you tell us what, what is your best-selling book physically and or online 
And also, is um is Miss Anne Wormsley still alive, still around? Yeah. I don't deal with that a lot. Anne, Anne Wormsley is still around. Um, she's not, you know, her health is not that good, but she's still around. Okay. And your best-selling I mean, book? The best-selling books? Hmm. Is this the new beacon or the bookshop you're talking about? A uh, new beacon. Bookshop. Well, I would say um, the campaign books, How the West Indian Child, New Cross Massacre, uh, History of the Voice, um, uh, For the Liberation of Nigeria. Uh, maybe that may be our biggest seller in truth. Um, those, those were the, our, our top sellers. All right, two quick more questions. Um, did you get to meet Ivan Van Sertima? No, I didn't. No, I didn't. It was slightly before. I was a bit too young. I was there in attendance, but I, was, I wasn't able to interact. But yeah, actually, so Van Sertima came to New Beacon Books? Yes. Uh, he was part of the CAM, the CAM movement. Wow. Okay. And last question for me. Um, can you, tell, can you tell us a bit about your fight, your, your successful fight to kind of end banding in North London? A little bit, please. Um, it, it, it wasn't, I was, as I said, I, I was a bit too young to be part of that. Um, it was uh, John LaRose leading it with the um, North London West Indian Association and what was called the Highgate Radicals, that is some um, Labour Party people who are very, um, very high in the Labour Party, um, really against the local council, which is Hange Council, and how they plan to ban and bus people throughout um, London, uh, and they were successful in stopping that. But there were other campaigns in other parts of London based based upon. The same, the same strategies. Yeah, thank you. That's it from me, Michelle. Over to you. There's a couple of questions in the chat, so over to you. Thank you. Um, thanks everybody for your comments and shares. And um, yeah, I appreciate that. So um, I can't necessarily see all your names, but um, someone is asking about. Um, someone asked about the photo. I hope that was satisfied, um, and it wasn't a photo that was showing the size, I suppose, of the the book fair. Um, where was it actually, Michael? Where was the book fair again? Which which space? It, it was in, in, a, in quite a few places, right? It started off the very first one was in Islington Town Hall. And we then went to different town halls in different parts of the community. Mm -hmm. So we went to Brixton Town Hall. Mm -hmm. um, we went to St Pancras Town Hall in Camden. We went to Acton Town Hall. And we went to Bradford and Manchester, um, where uh, it, uh, people like Gus John and Ali Hussein and Talat and Dr. Aura were based. Uh, part of what we call the Alliance, um, which was very influential in um, the New Cross Massacre Action Committee. Mm -hmm. That is, mm -hmm. um, it was um, Black Youth Movement, Black Parents Movement, Grace Today, Bradford Black, and the Black Parents Movement had branches in, in West London, which is um, people like Eric and Jessica were part of that. And uh, in uh, Hackney. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so that should give the idea, bearing in mind most of us know what the town hall looks like, we can get a, an idea of, of, of the space. Yeah. Of it. Um, there's another question where it's saying, um, New Beacon has been working to decolonize the curriculum for decades. Now that schools and universities have finally discovered the concept, how is New Beacon contributing to the growing movement of students who are demanding decolonization, both of the curriculum and schools, universities um, themselves? So in a, is new, what's New Beacon doing in, with this new version of decolonization? Yeah. Um, it's absolutely correct. Um, part of that decolonization struggle has started just with the formation of New Beacon 
and the way that um, we've been so deeply involved in education, education campaigns. I think um, I wouldn't say that we're actively involved with the decolonizing the curricular movement, but we are there to make the information and ideas accessible through the books we have. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Michael. And there, there's one from Kevin um, Sikoyama. Um, are you familiar with Vince Hines and were any of his books sold in New Beacon? Yes, they, they were. Um, I can't remember the titles of hand, um, but uh, someone like Gus, Gus John would be, uh, you know, would have known him very well and would have been, uh, you know, working with him or working alongside him at some point. Okay, good. I'm just seeing if there, there's some comments, but before we do that, Michael, I didn't get to ask you about that, um, the relationship with the Huntley children, because you were all children of that generation. And how, tell me about that um, whilst I look through the other. I remember I said that we did not come alive in Britain, that's John saying. Mm -hmm. And essentially, the political people from all over the Caribbean who were involved with the, 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 the anti-colonial struggle, a lot of them ended up in London as exiles. And so Jessica and Eric, uh, Lionel Jeffries and Tansy Jeffries, uh, they, they, they're both from Guyana. Uh, all these people used to come and meet in people's houses, like my house in, in, in um, Hornsey. And uh, at one point, Eric and Jessica and Chauncey, their, their, their two sons, Chauncey and Carl, um, all lived in our house in Hornsey. And at summer times we would spend, there, there were two sets of boys. Uh, the Jeffreys had Howard and Andre. Uh, there was myself and Keith. And then there was Chauncey and Carl. And every summer we would go to each other's houses and spend, I don't know, I don't know how long, but it seemed like a long time <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in each other's houses. So on a personal level, uh, there is the political and the personal all rolled into one. Mm. And, and I must say that, um, that Eric is one of the people that I really honestly respect and, and hold dearly. Mm. Um, in, you have the privilege of meeting all these people, these writers, these thinkers, these activists. And you know, uh, it's, it's, you get to know people and you get to know those who are uh, tricksters and ginos and those who <laughs> will stand the stand the course and those who will not mm. and eric is one of those who, who stood the course mm. okay yeah thank you for that um so tony can you see any more notable comments um um there's one from yeah i got a question about errol lloyd um again what is his status now is he around and uh, what's he doing at the moment um, he is around, um, he, he, he comes to GPI events as well. Um, I think there's a project in the pipeline, but I'm not sure the detail of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm aware of a project as well um, that he's working on. I think he, I think he's possibly working on it with Nicole or Nicole knows about it, Nicole Rochelle Moore, but I don't know the details. So yeah, very much around. Um, you know, still active. Um, so yeah, as, as I said, I, I really do think that there's something needs to be done around Errol Lloyd and his massive contribution. Um, so yeah, there, there's another one here um, from Kevin. Um, were there a lot of black Americans that passed through New Beacon, especially during the 60s, 70s and the 80s? Uh, yes. yes. <laughs> Were. Um, as I told you, there was that 1968 uh, Black Power Conference at Alexandra Palace. Um, there were some Black Americans involved in camp, but being so young, I would not know exactly who they were. Mm -hmm. um, I remember um, Stokely Carmichael coming to, to our house to discuss things, general politics, <laughs> when he was here. 
Uh, I think the only time they let him in. Um, so they, they Kwame were, Toure for others who don't. Yeah, sorry, sorry, Kwame Toure. Yeah. <laughs> that bit. Yeah, and um, yeah, uh, they, I mean, New Beacon itself as, as, a, as a publishing house, um, I wouldn't say so, but um, New Beacon as a bookshop, yes, people came mm -hmm. and also all the events around New Beacon, uh, Black Americans were part of it. Mm. Okay, yeah, good. Um, yeah, um, I'm just, oh, there's somebody that was actually ordering as we were speaking, so that's quite good. They were ordering um, books online, so okay. that's the beauty of the technology. You can speak and then, you know, you're... I, I, hope, I hope it works. So it work. <laughs> no, it did work. Um, they were, they, there were some that were wondering whether you had copies of the Manchester... The, 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 um, yeah, you do. West. Um, and thanks, thanks, Emma, for sharing that, um, um, that link, because there was some... Um, also, Michael, are you open for business right now, at the moment? We, we opened two weeks ago. Uh, we opened um, on just the Friday and Saturday for the time being, 12, 12 noon to 6 p.m. Um, we, the, the pandemic has, has knocked us, of course, uh, for our survival, financial survival plan, but uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. But we're open on a Friday and Saturday, 12 noon to 6 p.m. What can we do to assist them? What can we do to kind of help you get people through the door? How can we assist? Tell, I mean, this is through the door and also find on the website. I think people have to make a political decision about buying books. Um, it is easier, no doubt, from Amazon or to buy books uh, that Kindle or audiobooks, I mean, that, that, that you can't fight technology. Mm. But if you make a political decision to support an independent radical bookshop, uh, that would be very good. All right. Well, we might come back and then do a couple more courses then, possibly. <laughs> yeah. Eleanor says, do you ever run creative writing workshops? Are we happy to pay and attend any of those? No. Um, Karen? Right now. Sorry, so I didn't catch all of it. What that's it, that's all. Okay. Um, we have run some uh, creative writing workshops. Uh, no, no, not workshops. Um, really, like, advice about publishing. Um, our policy, again, this is the politics of alliance, has been to support independent publishers, to support new writers, because you know how difficult that is, and the diversity of the ideas makes us all stronger. Yeah? So we've given advice to writers, we've given advice to new publishers, we try and support new publishers uh, who just brought out a book, etc. And we set up a, a, an event uh, where um, Margaret Busby and, and others spoke about how to publish and the problems and pitfalls and how to how to do it successfully. And Dr. Yeah. Michelle Asano, I'm sure you do some sort of creative writing workshops, don't you? Yeah, I was just about to say that I teach creative writing workshops and um, you know, in an, I've, I've been doing it online and I'm just coming to the end of the Afrofuturism, which is a creative writing workshop where I just mentioned that I have Erna Broadburn's book on it. It's the only text that I asked the students to purchase and I told them where exactly to go and um and, and get they have been and they have been which is great um yeah. so even if they don't read it I'm like you have it in your possession I've told you to get it and after I did the presentation on on Anna Brod but certainly I know they're now uh, then they'll, some of them will persevere and read it. So yeah, so I do, and the reading is so that they can then write. So I do that, that work, um, creative writing workshop. And as soon as we're able to, I would happily um, host those workshops at New Beacon Books. Thank you, yeah, that, that's all. I mean, if, you, if, you are, if you're attached to a school, if you're a student at university or college, come and buy some books that will help to support us. But also, um, as I said, it's a decision you have to make consciously. And where, where now we have the, the, the politics of consumerism, where we decide 
who we want to buy from and why we want to buy from them. I hope that decision has been made for you before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are so many different ways. I mean, if you're if you are a teacher anywhere, you're in a university anywhere, you recommend the, the books and you say to the to the, your, the institution, this is the, this is where you get it from. Um, and when you get it from them, especially now when they're trying to relatively appease us with this whole Black Lives Matter thing and um, and say, um, yeah, you know, we support you, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Whilst they're in that, we then go, okay, well, this is what we need and we need you to do it like this. We need this, these, these books for this curriculum. Can you get it from this independent Black book, book, book sellers? There are lots of us that are teaching. Um, in these institutions, or even not necessarily teaching, but we might be in, um, you know, some kind of other corp a corporate um, entity that is looking to decolonize their their workforce. We have to be creative about how we approach this. Yeah, and Eleanor's also, saying. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. No, you go. You go ahead, Michael. No, no. And also that we must not forget the young people, the children, the young brains, the future and make sure that they know that there are these black books and these black bookshops around so that people can go to. Bring, bring your children, bring. I learned from 10 years old, uh, you know, being around New, New Beacon itself and going out and, and talking to people about books and uh, meeting artists and writers, etc. Mm. Um, Eleanor is asking, do you have like a a donation page where she can donate money to you on a monthly basis. Have you got some sort of PayPal or Cash app that people can donate we, every we month? We do have a PayPal account. I am very willing to take any regular donations you can offer. So uh, give me a give me an e send me an email uh, and we'll make sure it, ha it happens. Uh, we can just put it into the chat if you know how to do that, um, Michael. Just type in the say chat. that again. You can just type into the chat room. I'll put it. I'll I'll, okay. I'll put it in there. No, sorry, I'm not that advanced. <laughs> Emma says you can push purchasing from independent bookshops as part of the decolonizing agenda. Right. No, no, I, I would definitely agree. We've been decolonizing a long time. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Okay, Tony. I think we come to the end. Hold on, let me just put that um, address in here. New Beacon Books. I, I might see a, a question about Jan Karu. Okay, yeah. Is that, is that a question there? Yeah, a yeah question. they were asking whether he came. Um, whether he came. Um, are you familiar with Jan Karu? And yes, yes, yeah. yeah. And 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 he has he he was. I think he was part of Cam. I'm not quite sure, but um, he did come to the bookshop definitely. He's a Guyanese writer. Okay, I think on that point we're going to wind up. So Thank thanks, you. Mr. The Rose. Thanks, Miss. In fact, over to you, Michelle. <laughs> Why over to me? Because <laughs> you're the boss in it. Thank you myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you, Tony. Um, thank you, Michael. Thank you to everyone yeah. who has stayed on this um, this Zoom platform and have um, participated and have been coming thus far. The three of these sessions next. I don't know when it is, but there's another one. The, the, next the, Wednesday. We're looking at um, Center Prize next Wednesday. Yeah. So thank you all and have a good, good weekend evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, Michael. Bye-bye.